Folks, we got a great show for you today because that was Kevin Cashman. Kevin's the author of a fantastic book called Leadership from the Inside Out, Becoming a Leader for Life. And that's the book we talk about here today. Although Kevin's written five other books, including The Pause Principle, Step Back to Lead Forward, and Awakening the Leader Within. Um, Kevin is a best-selling author. He's a global thought leader and CEO coach. And he pioneered the grow the whole person to grow the whole leader approach to transformative leadership. He was the founder of Lead so Leader Source. He was the founder of Leader Source Limited and the Chief Executive Institute. And in 2006, Leader Source was acquired by Corn Ferry, where Kevin is now the global co leader of CEO and enterprise leadership development. He ends up running 130 offices globally. So in, in the book we discussed today, Leadership from the Inside Out, we talk about these eight pathways to achieving that leadership from the inside out. And they're forms of mastery we've got to get to, whether it's personal mastery, story mastery, purpose mastery, with a great quote from Mark Twain. The two most important days of your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. Purpose mastery. Love it. We get into interpersonal mastery, change mastery, resilience mastery, being mastery, and coaching mastery. We talk about this leadership journey from serving the I as a direct contributor to serving the we, where you're leading the team, and, and how important it is to have a balance actually of both. Um, Kevin obviously has amazing experience, and by the way, just a shocking track record. When his firm was acquired by Corn Ferry, there were about 900 million in search and 10 million in consulting, and now they're a, a billion in both. So it's just been an amazing growth journey at Corn Ferry. And, and I love um, Kevin's approach to purpose and meaning and, and developing the person. He, he's also got some great stories about coaching NHL players and NFL players, some of the top performance athletes in the world. I really enjoyed my conversation with Kevin Cashman here today, folks. I'm sure you will, too. And if you enjoyed today's podcast, please like and subscribe to the Selling Well podcast, because that helps us to get other great guests, guests like Kevin, because that helps us to get other great guests like Kevin. Here's Kevin Cashman. Hey, Kevin, thank you so much for joining the Selling Well podcast. It's so great to meet you. Well, it's really my pleasure to to be here. So thanks for the invitation and thanks for uh, letting me add to your well, well and wellness of selling. Well, thank what a great way of putting it. And and um, so, Kevin, I was extremely excited and slightly embarrassed to to run the podcast here today because you know, as a matter of course, of course, we'll do the reading on some of the great guests that we have. And I chose to do a deep dive on a book that it's amazing to me, I hadn't read it before. So your book, Leadership from the Inside Out, Becoming a Leader for Life, is one of those very unique books. And folks listening, this is in the third printing. 2017-18 was oh, the third, third edition. Edition. It's probably 20 printings. So third edition, thank you. And so for those who aren't experts in publishing like me, when you do research into this, you'll never get a second edition unless it's a runaway bestseller. But to have a third edition is just shocking. And well, it's shocking. such a... I'm sorry, Mark. It's shocking to do it, too, <laughs> because you actually get these markers of what you've learned in between the editions. And it's quite shocking, really, in a, in a very positive way. And the third edition is 70 percent different than the first edition. Uh, the principles held up. But the research, the um, stories, the emphasis, the writing got much better. <laughs> All sorts of things changed. So it's not a superficial thing. 
Wow. And I'd heard uh, in some of my other research, Kevin, that in between the second edition and the third edition, you changed 40% of it. Yeah. So, so yeah. just a massive amount of change. Yes. Now, I don't know how all of that math works, but sometime, somehow it did change that much in each edition. <laughs> well, listen, the, the edition, I'm reading the third edition and, you know, so fundamental in terms of this connection between leadership and personal growth. And as you aptly point out, these are these are themes we've seen quite a bit. Between your first edition and now, that length of period of time, other people have published great works referencing this connection. But before we do a deep dive and, and jump in, um, Kevin, you, you've got a very interesting background, you know, having been an entrepreneur and then having your business lead source uh, uh, limited acquired by Corn Ferry in 2006. Tell us a little bit about that professional journey that you've been on. Well, um, I'm glad you find it interesting. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know if I can call it interesting, but it's surely been it a, sure fulfilling, a fulfilling journey, I have to say. And I think if there's anything I've done well, and you know, it's not easy to say that as your first uh, speaking, but with humility, I think if I've done anything well is I've organized my life around purpose, what is really important. And to me, elevating the growth of people, I call it growing beyond, and meaning we all can grow beyond wherever we are right now. That's what you know learning is all about. And I bet it's about what selling well is all about too. Sure is. Right? The um so I've been true to that journey. So I've been very, very, very fortunate to to uh, organize my business around this this purpose of helping people grow beyond. So it started off early. I mean, I I got a psychology degree because I was interested in human development, and then I was going to go for a PhD in psychology, but then started using psychology to coach professional athletes. NHL players, uh, 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 National Football League players, uh, and Olympic athletes. And basically, I was helping them do a counterintuitive thing, and that is relax before they compete and stay as relaxed as they possibly could at their peak effort. And it's counterintuitive, but it translated really well. And I had, remember the purple people eaters? You yes. probably, but way, way back, they were in the Super Bowl and these four massive guys, I'm sitting with them in a conference room and teaching them how to meditate and relax and all of that. It was, I wish I had a video of it because it's <laughs> this little consultant and these gigantic guys. But you know, it, it it really helps. So that was my entree into applying psychology and mindsets to performance. And then from there started helping executives. Um, part of my psychology background was in career and vocational psychology. So it was natural for me then to start coaching executives in transition and not just get another job, but what would be most fulfilling and purposeful. Mm. You know, was the real hidden opportunity for them. It wasn't about getting a job. It was about being fulfilled in that job in their life. So we did that, built that up, transitioned that company because uh, I finally learned from a CEO. He was the godfather pizza CEO who, after we helped him transition, he said, do you know what business you're in? And I said, yeah, I know what business I'm in. And he said, I don't think you do. Mm. Um, you're in the business of helping leaders develop, not just transition. This has been the best development experience of my life. And then light bulbs went on and we started taking the methodologies we had learned in transition around purpose and uh, leadership and teamwork and culture and so on. 
and then started applying it explicitly to developing senior people. And then we developed these institutes called the Enterprise Leader Institute, the Executive to Leader Institute. And then long story short, or maybe long story shorter, (laughs) (laughs) is uh, then we grew that and went from local to national and international. And it just became too much for us to manage multiple locations. And then we started looking for a partner. And eventually after almost two years, Corn Ferry convinced us to join them when they were $10 million in consulting and they're about 900 million in search. Well, the end of the story from a sales standpoint is now search is a billion and consulting is a billion. Wow. So, yeah, it, uh, it's been quite a ride, quite a ride. And, and then today, Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, you're the global co-leader of the CEO and enterprise leader development group within Corn Ferry. And you know, you're overseeing, really working with up to 130 different offices globally. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. Um, you know, Corn Ferry decided uh, to be all things talent instead of be the largest executive search firm in the world, which they still are. They decided to be the largest talent management firm in the world to not just acquire people, but how do you develop them, compensate them, structure organizations and strategy. And that long title, what it means is myself and our group uh, develop CEOs and CEO successors and develop enterprise leadership, which we can talk about if you want. It's a very different kind of leadership at the very top of the house and cascade it down into the organization. Well, um, and by the way, Corn Ferry acquired Miller Hyman. Yes. So so Miller Hyman, still to this day, that core fundamental methodology originally created around 88 or 91, around there. I always get the dates mixed up. That is still one of the most foundational sales methodologies for a complex sale today. And about 60% of most sales books refer back to that core methodology of multiple people influencing the sale, personal win, professional win, you know, red flags, strengths, weakness, really fantastic stuff. And Alice Hyman's a frequent guest on this show, by the way. Oh, that's fantastic. I assume there is a connection, but I did not know that. And it also is interesting around Corn Ferry is they, they do 19 evaluations of firms for every firm they acquire. So mm-hmm. the due diligence is really high. And our track record, we've had like 24, 25 acquisitions over the last 17 years. And Corn Ferry's ability not to just pick the premier thought leader, process leader, program leader, but the right people too. So it's really been quite amazing what's been done. Well, it's also been such an amazing and really interesting journey for you. I do want to double click a little bit on this. Purpose driven. You talked about, you know, this being one of these fundamental principles for you in your entire life. You've been very purpose driven. I love the quote from Mark Twain that the two most important days of your life are the day when you're born and the day you find out why. That's that's in the early going of the book, if memory serves. But I I, I stole that quote. I'm going to use that quote quite Beautiful. frequently. But just Beautiful. I just love that quote. And and so, you know, we've, we're commonly um, accused of saying that sales leadership is really the X factor of professional sales today, in our view, Kevin. Mm-hmm. So, so kind of interesting stats for our industry. There's seventy billion dollars spent annually on training professional salespeople in the U.S. It's about five thousand dollars per person uh, on average is spent. A company spend 20% more training salespeople than any other business function. Yeah. The amount of money spent training sales leaders is so small, they don't chart it. 
Mm. It's a very interesting dynamic because sales leaders are quite comfortable sending their team out or having people like us come in to train the team because they'll say the team needs training. Yes. They're far less comfortable putting up their hand and go and saying, I need help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as a result of which, whether you're a chief revenue officer or a sales VP of sales, the average tenure for that title right now is shockingly short. Mm -hmm. okay. Almost under two years, if you believe recent Gardner research and, and some of its McKinsey research as well. Well, CEOs are as low as four to five years now. Yeah, it's a very, very uh, challenging environment. So I, I'd like us to talk, maybe let's get into the book a little bit where we talk about the pathways to mastering leadership. I have so many questions, you know, what's changed over the three editions, but at the core we talk or, or you write about these eight pathways to mastering leadership. Um, personal story mastery, purpose mastery, interpersonal change mastery, resilience mastery, being mastery, I'd like to double click on that one for me, and then coaching mastery. Mm -hmm. do, do you mind if we unpack a couple of these, Kevin? Tell us how you came to this great. framework. That would be great. If I could back up and piggyback on your introduction, and then we'll, then we'll go to the aid mastery because you really provoke something. Sometimes we say leadership changes everything. Now, it might be changes everything for better or worse, mm. but it changes everything. So if great leadership changes everything, Great sales leadership changes leadership. Ah. Right? It does. Because what happens if any leader is not influential enough, serving enough, understanding needs enough? So you could make a case, which I'm sure you wouldn't mind. Is <laughs> is that sales leadership changes everything, if you think of it in the broadest sense. I completely agree. And we see it in practice. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, as you, with your experience, and, you know, one of the things you write about, one of the, one of the many benefits of joining Corn Ferry, one was your reach. Mm -hmm. You know, the 100,000 executives that you're working with annually or the, or monthly that you actually end up touching, you, you know, you've a research based on 7 million executives. There's assessments done, I think, if I've got the, the number right, just shocking scale that validates the research. At a much smaller level, Kevin, we're working with these mid-sized companies when we either bring in, help them find the right sales leader and properly on board that, that sales leader, we can see the change in a year. It's absolutely amazing. We've seen the other examples as well, where something is running smoothly, there's a change made, and the, the, the amount of time for a neg negative impact to take place, it is mm -hmm. so crazy quick. It's it shockingly quick. You know, Sometimes keeping the wind in the sails, if you've got a leader who believes in the potential of the team and they believe their job is to uncover that potential, so all these great things happen. And then suddenly we may get, you coached uh, hockey players, the Wayne Gretzky effect, where the best salesperson comes in, becomes a leader, mm -hmm. but their joy isn't developing people. Mm -hmm. Their joy is doing deals. Mm -hmm. And they see everybody else as a tool to help them hit a bigger number. Completely yes. different environment. This is where uh, sales leadership and enterprise leadership come together. Because typically we're developed as an executive leader sales executive leader or any other kind of leader. And we come up through a silo and we get reinforced for producing results 
Yes. We get in the bad habit of I produce results. <laughs> and we is a bit of an afterthought. It's the same thing in enterprise leadership. We come up through a function. We get really skilled at running up and down stairs in a vertical. And we develop a certain fitness, musculature, aerobic capacity for a certain sport. Yes. And suddenly, whether it's the marketplace or our own awareness or some mentor or advisor says, wait, that sport, you still need to do once in a while. But now you're in a lateral sport. Now you have to go across. You have to think across, collaborate across, innovate across, share resources across, coach across, help your colleagues across. And that juncture of the I to the we is the most difficult mm. um, juncture in development for executive to enterprise leaders. And I bet for sales leaders too. The the serving the I or serving the bigger we. Well, I'll, without going to other folks' research, uh, you know, there's volumes of research on this. I'll, I'll share my own experience of making that transition. Right. I, I back in 2000, I was that person who'd been a successful salesperson and was promoted to leader. And within a 90-day period of time, not only was everybody who reporting to me was reporting to me miserable, but I was miserable. It felt yeah. like the worst job of my life because it was still about me, the I. Mm -hmm. And now I was frustrated because I was now responsible for the performance of five other people. And for the life of me back then, I couldn't understand why they just couldn't do everything exactly the same way I did it. It didn't and make any sense to me. Then you'd have to do it for them. <laughs> and I was happy to tell them exactly what to do. And I was yeah. so surprised when they didn't want to hear it. So, so it was only after, Kevin, it's so funny with larger co companies, even, I, even though I was terrible at the role and I was thinking of leaving, I ended up getting promoted again. And what I got promoted to was a different division, different side of the business, leading a different group of people in a business I knew nothing about. Yeah. So in every interaction with someone, they'd come in and say, here's what's going on, what should I do? My knee jerk was, I have no idea. What do you think you should do? Mm -hmm. And suddenly they started to enjoy the process. And I started to enjoy the process and they were getting elevated. And I realized that is the true joy. Beautiful. It's actually one of the main reasons we run our training company. We just love seeing people develop. Yes. You know, there's, as you mentioned, there's so much research on this. Um, one piece of research uh, from Zenger and Folkman in the book Extraordinary Leader is they took a look at people who were mainly about getting results, a little more the eye to impact kind of leader. So they, they were known for getting results. Another group was known for teaming and, and people skills. And those two groups actually produced about equivalent outcomes. But there was a third group that got results and connected with people. Mm. They were 67% more, you know, a huge amount more effective. So that's the principle. It's not I or we, it's I and we to um, produce more impact. Tell us a little more about the connecting with people. What do we mean by that? Well, it it basically gets into emotional intelligence. Goldman, Goldman's work, Yale's work, CCL's work, Corn Ferry's work too. Um, and uh, normally we think about connection, I think a little superficially. We have a little chat. We, you know, use a little humor, which, believe it or not, I love. Even though <laughs> the CEO told me, you say you love humor, but you're not very funny, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so sometimes we think of it in terms of that kind of banter, and it's important that it, it is a connection. But there's two things that are coming together. Deep self-awareness and authenticity and understanding of what I have and what I don't have and being real about that and being real and revealing about it. Mm. Because that builds a lot of trust. Not trying to always look better than we are, be who we are, be honest about what we have, what we know, what we don't know. It builds a tremendous amount of trust in us. So that's part of the equation is deep personal authenticity and awareness that builds trust. The other thing is deep awareness of others and deep care of others wanting to know what your needs are, what your goals are, and not doing it as a consultative selling technique, right. which, by the way, are great, <laughs> <laughs> but doing consultative selling with a heart and with care that wants to help. And when all of that is happening at the same time for both people, it's kind of electric mm -hmm. and time kind of stops and we have a great conversation and we want to work together. That's the magic that it's a magic born out of authenticity and curiosity and real care. You know, it's, it makes so much sense. And I think we, everybody listening to this, will have examples in their career where they knew they were reporting to or working with, you know, a boss like that. They felt it. Yeah. Now, that boss didn't have to be warm and, you know, coddling all the time. They might give significant challenges or hold you accountable, you know, with love. Yes. Um, to, you know, or even a coach. You talked yes. about athletics at the beginning. Sir, I certainly had many coaches like that. Mm -hmm. But if you actually believe their intent was making you better, it changes everything. Yeah. Now, sometimes you have to discover their intent later. And sometimes that's too late. But underneath that intent, the thing that really works is presence. Presence. We know when somebody's really there for us and with us. That's the foundation. And that you can't fake it. You are either really present or not. And people have a radar for it. I've I've got a um I'm I'm doing all these old sports stories. So I'm very aware. we love sports on this oh, show. I maybe maybe I'm overdoing it, but no, 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 we but, love it. There's there's a Vince Lombardi story that came to me. Uh, firsthand. And I had the good fortune early in my career, I had this kind of athletic connection and so on. So I had two CEOs who were on Vince Lombardi's uh, world champion, first Super Bowl, second Super Bowl. Okay. Oh, Super wow. Bowl. Yeah, they were both players. Now, this is like 25 years after their Super Bowl. So it's not that long ago, but it's still quite a ways. So and I get this laboratory where I'm meeting with each of them and I can't tell the other one that I'm working with this other one. <laughs> right. If, if they, if they say, Hey, I just talked to such and such, then okay, fine. And they, they divulge that. So I had this laboratory of these two kind of independent um, situations. So what am I interested in asking them as a punchline? Well, what was it like with the Lombardi? What impact? Right, right. I knew it had an impact, but I couldn't just say it in the beginning. I had to build trust. And then I was going to get ask them and get the, the real deep answer. Well, what was interesting is they both used the same word, which was shocking, to describe Lombardi. I mean, we all know Lombardi, the tough, win at all costs you yes. know, kind of person. So they both said the same word. They both said, I've never been so loved by anybody 
in my career, maybe my family, right? I've been loved as much or more, but in my career, I've never been loved by a human being like Lombardi. Wow. Yeah. So here was his success is hidden. You could write a book about this. This was his hidden success formula. They knew he was in it with them and for them no matter what. So he earned the right. He earned the right to push them to no end because they knew he loved them. Mm -hmm. That is a real, that's real leadership. And, um, you know, I'm inspired thinking about it right now. I mean, it's just, it's so foundational, but you you just can't, you, he didn't have to do a lot of uh, speeches and sales talks. No, he would have them over to his house and cook dinner and he'd love them like a family. Hmm. And so they'd do anything for him. Well, we, we can, you know, love is such a strong and powerful word. Word you you use the same example in the book, of course, with Shaq and his college coach. Oh yeah, Dean. Dale or Dale, like uh, yeah. Sorry, okay. but Dale's last name escapes me. But but it's too I bad because he's an amazing uh, mentor of of generations of talent. You know, we I, I can think through. I was a hockey player and and was a goalie. And when I was playing uh, prep school hockey, which was okay, you know, for Canada, that was much higher, higher levels, but it was pretty good. But but our coach had been a former professional goalie. Oh, yeah. And and I knew that he cared. Now he could be direct. Yeah. And there was there was some tough thing, you know, but he was a, just a great guy and I knew he cared. So even for a young person, 17, 18, I knew his intent was yeah. trying to make me better and helping me get through certain plateaus or ceilings of complexity for what we we're doing. And you're right, you do anything for them. Isn't that fantastic? The thing that just got sparked, I'm thinking, um, you're not wide enough to be a goalie. <laughs> <laughs> you, must have right. been, you must have been really fast. Well, you know, I'm also not that tall. So I'm only six feet tall. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's, you know, today, in today's game, it's much different. You block the net. But, yeah. but um, you know, in my day, you actually had to give a little piece of net to somebody and then oh, take yeah. it away. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Really, really interesting. But these principles we were talking about re really hold up. I mean, when when you get down to it, whether it's athletics or business or selling, it's how we employ who we are, how we know who we are, and how we employ who we are to make a difference. And it really, the venue doesn't matter, but... Becoming a leader for life is what's important. I mean, getting the next million dollar sale is really important. Going home and um, influencing our family, <laughs> not selling is not popular at home, but in <laughs> influencing. That's for sure. Right? And uh, influencing towards something that's important, it's universally applicable. You know, when you talk about authenticity, you know, our experience is a, a couple of things with some of the teams we work with, not always leaders, but certainly with younger generations as they're coming up, we're encouraging them to be their real self, but they're not comfortable. Yes. And part of it is we all have those things. Somebody thinks, you know, a young person's a little bit in debt or they went out and partied a little bit too much two weekends ago and they feel bad and they feel like they have to keep those things, you know, in some ways hidden away. They're not comfortable understanding. We all have that stuff. Mm -hmm. So so with the younger folks, we just try and be yourself. Nobody wants a marketing automatron in sales. Yes. With more of the leaders that we manage, we, we talk about authenticity. Um, 
But but let's talk about this, and you bring this up a little bit in the book. Most leaders either think they're being authentic or they don't think there's an issue with authenticity because yeah. whatever state they're in is what they're showing. Yes. So, so if somebody out there is is listening to this today, then Kevin, let, let can we unpack that a little bit and say, well, what do we really mean by authenticity, and and how do you assess whether you are authentic in front of your team? Well, uh, let's just get the assessment part out of the way because there's a very uh, valid and valuable way to do it in in companies that use 360 methodology where the person ranks themselves on different behaviors and characteristics. And then other people above, across, and below get to do a similar ranking. And if those tools are valid and the interpretation is really good, we get to reconcile right. what we see ourselves versus how others see us. Now, the interpretation of this is science, but it's real art too. Because sometimes we see things in ourselves others don't see. And then our developmental challenge is revealing more. Okay. So people can experience who we really are. Mm -hmm. Or other times people see things in us that need to be developed that we don't see. And then can we be open to that and learn and grow and so on? So it's a great process. It needs really great coaching and interpretation to know what to do. Because sometimes we get feedback from others and we go, oh, that's what we should do. Well, maybe you should do it, but maybe you should do it differently based on who you are and your life right. story and, and so on. So it's this reconciliation of, again, individuality and, and social constructs. And we're somewhere in between uh, in terms of our authenticity. Now, authenticity is important throughout all of business. Are our products or services really authentically creating value? And if they're not, you are in the wrong company and mm. they are in the wrong business. So those are tough decisions. So, and that's not a reactive decision. That's a really important thing. And we could go on and on. What is an authentic product or service? It's probably a product or service that has a real purpose that's really enhancing the lives of the people it touches. It's probably more authentic when it does that. If it destroys more value than it creates, which certain products do, um, you have to really challenge yourself should you really, really uh, be there. So, but the key thing with authenticity is not kill me. This is who I am. Mm -hmm. You live with it. It's like, um, I love my dog, but I probably wouldn't take it to a board meeting at uh, at Johnson & Johnson. Right. You know, it might be authentic for me, but it doesn't create value for others, right? Right. So authenticity ultimately has to reconcile what's real and important for me, what really creates value, value to the audience that I'm serving, and finding that sweet spot is where our authenticity will create value into who we're serving. Again, mm. the reconciliation of the I and the we. If authenticity is all in the I, then it's kill me and I'm this and, you know, you have to accept that and, you know, the heck with you, right? No, right. it's it's both and authentic in the I connected in the we creating value. That's That's what real authenticity is. And we actually define leadership as, and this is not leadership in a hierarchy. This is leadership in the hierarchy and in life. We define it as authentic influence that creates enduring value. Hmm. So that gives you a sense of authenticity across the I, the we, and the enterprise. So, so. 
um, creating value, which mm-hmm. leads a little bit to the way you you dedicated the book. That dedicated the book to those value creating leaders with the courage to commit to authentic personal transformation and the passion to serve the world on purpose. That sounds really good. I hadn't heard that. Yeah. It does. Yeah, I thought so too. That's why I pulled it out. <laughs> That's exactly the point. Yeah. So whoever wrote that, good on them. <laughs> I'm talking to the guy who wrote that. That's why I'm so excited today. I'm actually, you wrote that. Well, that that those are great principles. One of the ones we haven't talked about, we've, we've talked about courage. Sorry, we've talked about purpose. We've talked about this authentic, you know, being authentic. We'll talk a little more about transformation, but let's speak to courage because that's a constant theme throughout the book. It is. How do we define it? And, you know, is this a muscle that we can develop? Yeah. Yeah. Really, really great questions. I mean, we could take a quest, 60 minutes on <laughs> question. It's really a good one. Um, we just finished a, a three-year research study on enterprise leadership. Hmm. Not only figure out in today's world, what are their capabilities, which were not that shocking, but what are their capabilities? But then what are underneath their capabilities? What are underneath their the clusters of competencies and skills? And five mindsets uh, became really clear. So these mindsets are deeper than the behaviors or capabilities. And two of these mindsets we've already touched on, purpose and courage. We can talk about the other three, too, because they're all equally important and have a certain dynamic between them. For instance, when you have purpose and courage, these two are mindsets that if they dance together, are more powerful. For instance, Mm. if you have high courage and low purpose, you can do a lot of damage in the world. Mm. We've seen that. The history of leadership has a hell of a lot of damage and diminishing life in it when you look at the whole history. So there's a lot of courage and not a lot of service and purpose, right? And that's that's a literally lethal combination, right? Now, on the other hand, if you have purpose without courage, important things don't happen. Mm. They don't happen. It's a nice aspiration, but nothing moves. So this dance between the mindset of purpose, meaning how can I bring myself, my organization to others in a way that really touches and changes their life? Because yes. purpose is not purposeful, as you know. It's not real until it touches the lives of others. That's the measure of purpose. Are we really impacting lives or not? Um, so you've got the my a, a mindset around service and impacting people's lives, a yes. mindset, an openness to it, not a closeness, an openness. And we can talk about what that means in psychological terms if you want. But then the second thing is um courage. Courage is this openness to go for something new, different, or challenging, feel fear, and still go for it because it's important. Now, hopefully it's important to others more mm-hmm. than you or courage can, can go wrong, right? But if courage takes on things that are really important and even scary, but we go for it. And this is where purpose helps courage. We go for it because it's really important to us, right? And to all of us. So 
those two are particularly powerful. And I think if you only had two mindsets that you worked on, and uh, those would be the two. Uh, we actually studied, um, I mean, as you as you have said, it used to be 7 million, then now it's 28 million data sets of assessment. Wow. I just heard it's going up to 50. It's going to hit 100 before too long, right? Oh, smokes. Um, yeah. AI. It's, it's AI helps with all this, right? Yeah, it's growing exponentially, the people we get to assess and, and help. Um, but we we studied uh, courage across five industries. And and our hypothesis was, I think, is it going to be important in all of them? Is it going to be important in none of them? Are there certain industries where it's more important? And what was shocking to us, courage was the only um, mindset or capability, because it happens to be both, um, that showed up in all five industries. The mm. only one out of about 80 to 100 possibilities, it was the only one that showed up in all industries. So it's foundational. It's foundational to leadership. It's foundational to you know selling too. And, and we will talk about that, that openness, um, Kevin, but, but what are the other three mindsets? The other three mindsets after purpose and courage are integrated. Uh, I always say integrated. It's actually integrative thinking, integrative thinking. And this is uh, not just seeing the dots, but synthesizing the dots into new realities. Yes. And then constantly being trying to find the new dot that will change everything again. Mm -hmm. So that's this unending synthesis of thinking that's endlessly curious to find the the new synthesis. So it's a lot more than strategy. Um, you better have it if you're going to do strategy, but you better have it if you're going to innovate too. So it's it's a key thing. Another one is inclusion and. This is important to diversity, equity, and inclusion, D, E, and I. It's important to it. It's a mindset that supports that openness to difference. But we're looking at inclusion on more of a fundamental level, the connecting, uh, the including, the ideas and different perspectives of, of different people. This one feeds integrative thinking. Mm. These two really, they're different, but they really dance well together. Mm. I, and I can see your light bulbs already going on, so right. I, I don't have to <laughs> describe that more. And then uh, the, the last one, which could be seen to be the basis of the other four, two pairs that are dancing together, but a common denominator underneath all of them is the mindset of self-awareness and awareness of others, which is basically emotional, emotional intelligence, intelligence we yeah. talked about, because uh, without that, nothing else works. Um, I love this idea of these mindsets dancing together. That, that, that's an interesting thing for all of us to think about and the importance of them. Um, so many interesting things to think about here today, team. And just a reminder to everybody, um, we're talking about, you know, leadership from the inside out. So leadership from the inside out, becoming a leader for life. This is one of six books by Kevin, um, many of which have become bestsellers or identified as top well, two, sales. Two have, but uh, it sounds better how you said it. Yeah, that's a, yeah. We'll edit it, Thomas. Use my terms, would you? But <laughs> by the way, the the uh, waken the leader within, and one of the other top set, the pause principle, step back to lead forward. Um, the pause principle, step back to lead forward, and this book was recognized as one of the business books of the year. I yeah, believe. that's that's the other that's the other bestseller. Yeah. And it basically gets into uh, the counterintuitive idea that sometimes to accelerate, we have to step 
back in order to go forward more powerfully. Hey, hey Kevin, by the way, um, first and foremost, thank you so much for joining today. I've got, got one or two other quick questions because I have to be so cognizant of your time and you're so right. We could be on this topic for hours. Well, I'll come back if you want. We'd be delighted if you would come back, please and thank you. As we talk about these core concepts and principles, if I think of the last 10 or 15 years, I'm 56, so I've seen a number of things over the last 10 or 15. These are things that haven't changed dramatically in 5, 10, 20 years. They really haven't changed that much, the need for many of these things. But when you when you've created the second edition and third edition of the book, between the first and third, you changed seventy percent of the content. You know, I know you added one a different pathway, which was storytelling. But what really has leadership really changed that much, or is is most of the change in the book really coming from more research, more facts, more more referenceable stories, exemplifying these core concepts? Well, how I view it is there's two ends to thought leadership. One is, has to do with currency and and relevance now. So Mm. and that's where research emerges and says, you know, we're, we're seeing these correlations, right? So to me, that's one end of thought leadership that's always evolving towards the future. But what's interesting to me is that the principles go back thousands of years, right? thousands of years in thought leadership, not 10, 20 years. And so what fascinates me is these enduring principles of life, like trust and love and connection and purpose are not new. They're part of the human experience. And so they go back literally millennia. And what research does ultimately is discovers <laughs> what's there is physics. And mm. you know, all of this, you know, you know, all of physics doesn't discover what's not there, discovers <laughs> what's there, it reveals. So to me, that's where thought leadership gets really interesting is it's it's current and it has endured through human existence. So that's real thought leadership. It's both and. Fantastic. Well, well, Kevin, first of all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. (laughs) What What a pleasure meeting you and a real pleasure reading the book as preparation for today. And there'll be There'll be a couple of the other books we're gonna we're gonna take a run at before you come back and join us next time. How do the folks listening today learn more outside of buying uh, the book, which they're absolutely gonna buy, Leadership from the Inside Out? How do they learn more about you and what you're doing with Corn Ferry today? Well, um, there's really two websites. One is to take a look at the Corn Ferry website and see all the capabilities that run across um, Corn Ferry, and you've touched on Miller Hyman and you know the executive development, there's a compensation group, it goes on and on. So, th- so that's one thing that might interest people as, as a resource. And there's a lot of articles and research. We view uh, the website at Corn Ferry as a very giving kind of website. And then I have a website too, that connects to Corn Ferry, but it's Cashman, C-A-S-H-M-A-N, leadership.com. And so you can go there and, you know, I'm I'm highlighted and my articles and videos and thought leadership and books are there. Um, but you can also connect uh, to Corn Ferry and its capabilities as well. So those two websites would be, if if you're interested, places to go. We certainly are. So, so team, those will be in the show notes. And Kevin, thank you again for joining today. And folks, thank you so much for joining the Selling Well podcast today. As always, we do this to try and improve the performance and professionalism of B2B sales. 
and in doing so, improve the lives of professional salespeople. If you like today's podcast, please share and like the Selling Well podcast if you enjoyed it. That really actually matters to us. If there's something we can be doing to make these even more valuable to us, to you, pardon me, please let us know. You can email me, Mark Cox, at inthefunnel.com directly. That's my personal email. We love constructive criticism. The show today is really a result of you folks helping us try to make this better and better. So every note I get will respond to, that's me personally responding, and thank you in advance for doing so. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time on the Selling Well podcast.